Screen Junkie Studios in the heart of Los Angeles. This is Screen Junkies Movie Fights. Now your host, Andy Signore. Well, can I, how about a quick thanks to Robert Holby for that amazing looking 100. Dan, did you get to see that from the couch? No, that was I, slick. I couldn't get to see it. I that looked like we really were headphones. a real show. Yeah. That was awesome. Well, guys, that just said it for you. This is episode 100 oh, of Movie Fights. Congratulations. Thanks, guys. And we thought, what better way to celebrate movie fights than with just a regular good episode of movie fights? Because we tend to not do those these days. It's just like Mr. <laughs> Rogers' Neighborhood. Yeah, we tend to have like really gimmicky, long, crazy episodes. And this week, you know what we're going to do? We're going to have a good fight with three great fighters. And we're just going to enjoy and, and enjoy that we made it to 100. Uh, but man, some favorite, some of some great memories have been from the people at this uh, table. So thank you. I want to say, uh, well, I'll come back to it. Let me introduce you, and then I'll tell you what we're going to do. for Because there's more we're going to celebrate since we fit this milestone. But before we get there, there's so much fun stuff that we're doing today. Best live action Pixar movie. What movie should they make live action out of a Pixar catalog? Uh, Disney's doing a lot of those. Also, if we were making a sports movie uh, with movie characters, what would who would you cat? Who would you put in there? Who should be in the new Predator movie? Uh, along with so much more fun stuff that we're going to be debating too. So uh, stay tuned. But first up, uh, you know him uh, since the early days, man. Way back, you've come on the show. Uh, we mm -hmm. fact check. We can. I'm sure he can tell you how many times it's been. Uh, but Mike Carlson, hashtag Botanic. Yes, welcome. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me, as always. And thank you for inviting me to the 100th episode. Who can believe it? It's crazy. The, 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 your, everyone knows you as hashtag Botanicus. I know you're known for a lot of other popular hashtags, but that's oh, yeah. the one that really That's stuck. the top hashtag at this point. And I'm going to tease it. Uh, the fans don't really know, but you're, oh, you right. get to finally act as Botanicus in an upcoming special thing, don't you? That's true. Guys, we're doing an after credits. Botanicus. Finally I coming have, to life. Maybe his voice. <laughs> so I, I mean, we have to tell him here on the hundredth episode to look forward to that. That's coming soon. I saw the animation; it's pretty sick. And uh, Mike Carlson finally brings Botanicus beyond the hashtag because into the real life. Because you demanded it, America. <laughs> <laughs> so stay tuned for that. Next up, uh, professional baseball player and antihero. It's Cody Decker. Welcome back, sir. Third episode. Third episode. Hey, that's good. According to someone on Twitter, I am ranked seventy seventh. Oh, out uh, of how many? It, I have no idea, but I'm ranked 77th <laughs> in my 0-2 record here Sounds so far. Sounds good. And today I feel as though might be my day. There's 300, three people out of 100, that means 300 potential fighters, that, right? That's not so bad, yeah. I guess, right? It's, yeah, it's feel, better than half. I feel good about it. Although a lot of people have played the game more than once, so it's probably actually... no. I liked what you said the first <laughs> time. It felt good. 77 out of 500 people. Uh, guys, returning back from the show, uh, you know Freaks and Geeks and Glorious Bastards. So many great things that oh, we know and love. Please. Uh, Sam Levine, welcome back! Oh, thank you so much! I'm so happy to be back. As you can see, I'm very prepared. I was not just writing things down as you're introducing the other two uh, competitors. I'm very prepared. Hey, I know all three of you are busy, guys, so thank you for making the time here. And Sam, thank you for coming back. I know the last episode you were on was a little intense. No, it was fine. Honestly, that set the bar so high. Anything where we don't have to deal with the uh, you know historical uh, genocide... <laughs> Feels like I will a say, for, I said this on the, on the Periscope pre-show, but yeah, we've made a new rule that all, all entries should be fun. All answers should be fun moving forward, because that's what this show is. No oh, politics. So much for my yeah, stuff. So get out of here. <laughs> that being uh, said, let's we're have fun with it. Let's not depress everybody. Uh, on the couch today, fact-checking as always, my favorite movie fighter, Dan Merle. How's Hi. it going? That good? I'm, uh, woo, last week was, uh, something else. Yeah. Let's celebrate, though, and not, yeah, let's not focus on the, on the negatives. <laughs> that was a good time. I have a fact check for you. How yeah? about that? Yeah. Uh, Mike Carlson, this is, according to our stats, this is his 17th appearance on Movie Fights. What? You are the, <laughs> is the fifth most in Movie Fights history, so thank you wow, for returning. really? Yes. Yeah, 17? It goes wow. me, Spencer Howe, Nick, and then Mr. Carlson. Right I would have guessed six. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bad memory. <laughs> I guess. Yeah, really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, guys, it's been a lot of episodes, and honestly, so many that I actually forget sometimes what sure. happened when, and there's too much to forget. So here's what we're going to do, guys. We're not going to we're going to have a regular show today. We're going to have a lot of fun, but we're planning something even bigger for later in the year. Our two years coming up and the end of the year wrap up. We want to create a big spectacle, a big fancy special for all you movie fight lovers out there. So we are created the new hashtag movie hashtag movie fights 100. Um, and you can email us at movie fights 100 at gmail.com. We want you guys starting today 
tweet us up, make little videos on Twitter, email us videos from YouTube in the next few weeks and so on. Send us your favorite moments for movie fights. Tell us why you're their favorite moments. Record it. Send it to us. Tell us. We are going to stitch together an amazing special to share with you guys later in the year uh, where we break down and count down the best movie fight moments of the past two years because why not else? Why not celebrate really big? We didn't have time to do it for this episode, so we're going to do it at the end of the year because that's a good excuse, right? Yes. But no, really, we want to do it and share it with you guys. We want you guys to tape some messages. We're going to cut interject commentary from us, from everybody, as we count down some of our favorite moments from the past two years of the show, which is insane. Uh, so please partake in that and help us celebrate 100 movie fights. Hashtag movie fights 100. And you can email submissions and thoughts to moviefights100 at gmail.com. So keep them coming in. And I may be enlisting a few fans out there to help us actually track some more fans down. Because there's a lot of, it's 100 hours of show we got to go back and rewatch and find and say how many times I actually said this is tough, which I think Andy Schick actually keeps a pretty in-depth wiki, right, uh, Dan, with a lot of the facts? Andy Schick keeps a great... Uh, in fact, he's already at it. He tweeted, only 81 people have played official movie fights games. <laughs> you can add about 11 people or so to that. So Andy Schick is always on top of it. Cody always, Decker just gave the worst look. <laughs> always has the facts at hand. Thank you, Andy Schick. This you. is the more widely... Uh, scene show, so I'm not going to cuss at that person, even though they deserve it. You can do it on Twitter. Yes, I will. He's very good. He knows his numbers. He All right, does. So, uh, let's get to this, guys. For the hundredth episode, let's see who who wins. This will be this will be canon. You want to win this one because this is a memorable one. Oh I think. Well, hopefully, or it'll be a really big see, stinker. Really. We'll see in a little bit. Oh All right, in honor of a hundred episodes, let's watch a new movie fights montage. No way. Come on, let's get nuts. I want to fight you. you want to fight? Let him fight. Stop this fight, I'll kill you. I could do this all day. Oh! Wow. We're, we're trying some new ones out, so there we go. People have been bugging me for so long. Make a new mod! We did it, all right? We did it. <laughs> Thank you, Ken and everybody, and uh, Randy and everybody made it together quickly. Round one! Ugh. Guys, I'm so excited because Bridget Jones is back and she's got a baby. And I love when movies add babies. What's better? Because it makes the movie so much better when you just yes. add a baby, right? Add a baby. I mean, we all know this. So I want you guys in honor of having fun here on our 100th episode. Pitch us a random movie that's better with a baby. How do we make a sequel, make it fun, make it fun, but add a baby to the sequel. All right? All right. That makes sense? Absolutely. Yep. Mike, you're up first. All right. The year is 1992. A movie comes out that captures the hearts of America. It's got a little suspense and a lot of romance. I'm talking about The Bodyguard. I'm looking here for a sequel of The Bodyguard featuring a baby. Famous celebrity couple Jackie Latrey and Simon LaCroix are super famous. Oh my god, we have a... <laughs> that, that's just an approximation of what the movie would be. Was not, um, I did not approve that, but fine, we can go with it. They have a super famous, super beautiful baby. And obviously they have to fire, they have to, excuse me, they have to hire the best bodyguard in town to protect this baby. Now they are at a very famous movie premiere of a famous movie that they have just made. They're with their agents, their family, and they're celebrating. But unfortunately... A terrorist attack happens during this premiere, killing all of them. It's horrifying. Kevin Costner, reprising his role as Frank Farmer, the most, one of his most famous, iconic roles, notices this on TV. He's, of course, horrified. He talks to some people in the CIA, his secret contacts in the Secret Service and CIA, realizes that the terrorists plan to get the baby, too. So now, where's the baby? We don't see the baby. We're going to go get it. Frank Farmer takes that baby, and they go on a road trip full of adventure and hijinks. Just Kevin Costner and this baby. This is a movie that has suspense, action, and a man and a baby falling in familial love. Familial love with each other. All right, I'm talking about The Bodyguard 2, The Baby Guard. <laughs> How old is this baby? Just it's so a I'm baby, just... nine months. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Love it. Familial love. Got it. All right. Cody, you're up next. Good uh, luck. Yes. Uh, well, we've been, all been very, very privy to a long, long-running franchise, and that would be the James Bond series. I want to finally make James Bond fun again by adding a baby. Here's my pitch for James Bond in Live and Let Cry. A baby gets dropped off at the doorstep of MI6 with everything put on there. Yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> and clearly he will always be drinking. Um, you went old school, Bond. I appreciate that. Yeah. I really do. <laughs> oh, God. He's drinking a mint julep, by the way. Baby is kidnapped by Blofeld. Oh. Oh, boy. This is after James Bond takes his baby on missions with him because he will be doing his missions with the baby over a knapsack around his chest. In a Bjorn. Yeah, of course, okay. yes. He gets Bond kidnapped Bjorn. by Blofeld because he need, Blofeld needs something actual to do, and he wants to turn James Bond's baby into the ultimate weapon against James Bond. So he's going to take him and tr basically be his... Basically be his emperor to his, the Darth Vader. He's going to train this baby in the arts of murder, assassination, extortion, everything that is very good in Spectre. So that's the plan. That's the plot. James Bond's going to rescue his baby from Blofeld. Wow. Okay. Wow. Too, too much similar than I thought they'd be. Pitches already. Go ahead, <laughs> yeah. uh, now, Sam. Okay, obviously the first, the first two guys, you took, you took some pretty heavy dramas, some action, mm -hmm. action drama features, mm -hmm. where I, I was thinking more about Bridget Jones, and the first two Bridget Jones entries are fairly rom-commy. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, so while mine is not necessarily rom, it, it is more of the com. Um, now, it would have been too easy to go three men and a baby, but uh, I think we all remember three amigos mm. and a baby is where I'm going with mm -hmm. this. So uh, that's exactly right. It's three amigos and a baby. So what you have is uh, Dusty Bottoms, Lucky Day, and Ned Niederlander after uh, they're victorious uh, in, in Santa Poco. They save the town, they, they, they help everyone, they're, they're heroes. Um, they return back to California where they were, they'd been ousted, uh, only to find, uh, when they try to collect their things at the studio mansion, there is a friggin' baby with a little note, dear three amigos, this is your baby. Deal with it. And if they thought El Guapo was tough, wait till they find out about diaper duty. I'll, holding for laughter. At home. <laughs> Do we know which amigo is one of the amigos? We the dad? don't. We don't know which amigo is the dad, and of course, that's what spurs the debate: is how could they address this note to the three amigos? Clearly, one of us is the father. They were all philanderers. They all they were all male sluts out there, you know, d d dipping their dongs left and right in classic old Hollywood, and. Uh, and after uh, lots of, uh, you know, oh, is this the woman? Is that, you know, they have to try approaching old flames to see, hey, did you, is this the baby you left? And of course, it's n nobody wants to fess up to that. And the real twist, the real father, Harry Flugelman, the owner of the studio played by Joe Montaigne. That was his baby that he had outside of his marriage. And he was like, you got to get rid of that baby. And she's like, I know who to trust this with, the Amigos. Because they'll make sure they're going to oust Flugelman. And they do. Wow. And in doing so, they reunite that baby with its mother. Because, you know, she was shamed. And, uh, and then they oust Flugelman. And they get their contract back at uh, Flugelman Pictures. And uh, they're back. They're number one again. Wow. That's three great movies. All right, guys. Mm -hmm. Fight it out. Well, I'm going to start with a James Bond pitch. And I'm just concerned that there's not enough baby in the movie. Because the baby gets captured, and it's like if we're gonna need a, if we're gonna use a baby, we need a lot of the baby in it, okay? Because like we've seen just James Bond rescuing women, he's rescued uh, heads of state. We want to see him and the baby a lot. That should be the core relationship. I mean, I, I yeah, I, I agree. I, 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 I do wish there were more of the baby, and and I mean, I, I don't want to take on both of your uh, pitches at the same time, but anytime you you add a baby to action adventure it just becomes the ultimate liability in every scene i know the stakes have been the raised stakes are raised right? they're raised to a new degree but the problem yes. is with Thank the raising you. of those stakes every single scene is the same scene of oh protect the baby protect the baby and then it just becomes a one note movie what scares me the only thing that scares me about your pitch actually not yeah. the only thing the main thing that scares Please. me about, about your pitch is the fact that none of them are the father and i saw that in the movie father's day and it was terrible and where at the end it turns mm -hmm. out neither of them were the boy's father. Spoiler right. alert! But <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> As for you, uh, Kevin Costner is mm -hmm. apparently Liam Neeson in Taken now. 
Well, he's not... Look, Frank Farmer is a well-defined character that is totally different than the Liam Neeson taking character, okay? He has nuances that we can all... I could talk about them for hours. I'd I won't love for to hear. Can you brevity. give me one nuance? Just, yeah, talk for 10 seconds. He's, give me 10 second nuance. Okay, well, he's uh, stoic. <laughs> <laughs> And he doesn't have a family. Honestly, he's mm. totally different because Taken is all about family. This Kevin Costner character does not have a family. James Bond doesn't have a family. His parents died in a skiing accident. If the movie were about James Bond and this baby teaming up to take down Blofeld, oh, Bond then and I half. Might be, but, they, but they team up at first on missions, not unlike Leon the Professional. Okay, now we're learning more yeah, about Leon the Professional. He's, ta he's wearing the baby on his chest, taking down uh, Spectre operatives until it's kidnapped by Blofeld, and then Blofeld just wants to turn him into a weapon. Yeah, but as you do. But with now children. it's turning into a comedy. Now it's the pacifier. Um, no. Now it's every Bond movie with Roger Moore. Well. You had Connery. Okay. Well, I didn't make that. <laughs> there are a lot of movies, you, you're, both of your pitches, there are a lot of movies that we're comparing them to. Final I thoughts have, here, go ahead. I've never seen a movie where man and baby fall in familial love with each other. <laughs> that doesn't happen, and it's not weird. Because and I'm babies are it, incapable of love. That's what you, do you have a baby? I might. What, are you a cop? I'm looking in your <laughs> eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I have a dog. Okay, and oh, I can boy. tell that that dog, when he lo look into his eyes, he loves me. And a dog and a baby are basically the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So over the course of this fun action adventure romp, you are getting a fully original story, a dynamic that we have never seen on screen before. You just called the it a romp guard. for the first time. I. You're, well, you're changing. You're changing your genre here. You're changing the tone. I didn't mean to I say I said wrong. mine has been a comedy from day one, and here's my defense to none of them are the father. In the movie Three Men and a Baby, one of them is the father, and then it changes the whole dynamic. In my movie, none of these guys can be the father because none of them are responsible enough. That's what we learn. None of these men are responsible enough to be a parent. But they learn the responsibility of what it is to have a child and care for it without being its biological parent, and they learn maturity in the process. And that's the movie. James Bond has been a man whore for about 50 years now, and quite frankly, he doesn't really know the, uh, the entire concept of responsibility when it comes to an infant. He learns how to be a parent in this rescue mission at the end. It is, and finally, after watching Spectre, I need to see James Bond actually go after something with stakes, because that ending was about as impressive as... I don't know. This, which, so which Bond are you casting? I will stick with Daniel Craig because A, he'll do it because I saw Spectre. <laughs> Two, uh, or B, for those of us who are actually listening. Um, quite frankly, it's not any more dumb than L Ernst Stavro Blofeld than being his long-lost adopted brother all of a sudden. I think this is, could actually, <laughs> amazingly actually happen. All right, time. Heard, heard closings from all you. Dan. Oh, I didn't realize I'd been closed yet. Sorry, I, I said closings. Oh. Well, Dan, some on Twitter have, have pointed out that uh, Cody's uh, pitch resembles an episode of the show Archer, which uh, people mm. said they don't have a problem with it. They just wanted to point it out. I have to say, kudos to our Twitter crowd. I've gotten some fantastic pitches on Twitter. My dinner with Andre and his baby. <laughs> Snakes That's on good. a plane with a baby. Three men and a little lady with a baby. I thought about that. The too. room yeah. two. Lisa's pregnant, which I liked. Oh, and then this was my favorite. Yeah. Rosemary's baby and a baby. <laughs> I thought I almost picked that too. <laughs> yeah. So kudos to Twitter. Uh, I also have the poll. We which, did put a poll up. Oh, we did put a poll yeah, up. Okay. So I will give you those results after you make the ruling. Uh, yeah, I feel like one of you stuck to your guns and had the same pitch throughout is really where I was leaning. Uh, and the other one was changing it around a little bit. And uh, the comedy ultimately won in my eyes. I think Sam gets that first point. Thank you very much. Really great pitch. Thank you. Uh, where, did they, uh, where did they vote on the polls? The uh, poll on Twitter has, uh, it looks like it's pretty well settled. 46% voted for 007, Live and Let Cry. 38% Three Amigos and a Baby. Bodyguard 2, Baby Guard with 16%. 16? No. I'm sorry, Mike. Oh my sorry. God. All right, Sam's on the board first. Good round. To be fair, yours made me laugh the most. Yeah, yeah. But it didn't well, make man, any that's sense. That's at least a consolation was close. If, if it. Sam, it so then the actual if Sam had whiffed it too, then I, I might have le leaned towards you on just no a comedy. You're the set. judge. I, uh, everything you say, I believe. The only round I'll win, guys. Don't worry about it. <laughs> round two. So Benicio Del Toro may star in Shane Black's Predator. So what other two actors should join Del Toro's team in the new Predator film? 
uh, and what roles should they play? Uh, so we'll start with you this time, Cody. Tell us who should be in with Benicio, Benicio in the new Predator. Well, first things first, I think Michael B. Jordan would be my first pick of an actor playing in this movie. One, after seeing Fruitvale Station a couple years ago, I think Michael B. Jordan should be in absolutely everything, period. Showing in Creed, he showed that he has both the physical capability of holding his own in an action film like that, and he has the actual acting chops to not only go toe-to-toe with a two-time Oscar winner like Benicio Del Toro, but probably steal some scenes from him. The other person that I think that should be, be an actor that'd be very perfect for the movie is John Krasinski, and I know that sounds a little off, offbeat at first, but after seeing 13 Hours, which is you know two hours that I'd really like to get back, I do think he, has, he can easily pull off a look of a soldier with the proper comedic timing that would work perfectly well with Shane Black's writing style and his directing style. The way he, you know, put together Lethal Weapon or Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. I think you need to have a guy in there who could be witty enough and charming enough to withheld Shane Black's comedy stylings, which he's going to put in there. He put maybe a little bit too much into it into, say, Iron Man 3. I'm hoping it won't be just a laugh track throughout a Predator movie, but I think these two guys together would have a great dynamic together, and I think they're just two good actors that would really complement this film well. Great. Sam, what's your pick? Well, first off, I'm really looking forward to the Benicio Del Toro voiceover uh, that's going to accompany the entire movie full of witty quips about how the, uh, the Predator in here you know, they understand each other on a gut level. That's Shane Black. Um, okay, here's my answers. Uh, uh, so, because it's Benicio Del Toro, um, he's obviously a little older than uh, your typical uh, action star, and I think that that's where they're going with this, is I'm, I want to skew a little bit older on this, because these guys are, they're all longtime veterans. And so, he's going to be accompanied by The Rock, who's playing Blaine, which was the Jesse Ventura role in the original Predator. Uh, and I like this because I think it's a it's a different turn for The Rock, because Blaine's kind of a dick. And uh, and I think uh, I think that that is something we haven't really seen from The Rock a whole lot. He's usually the hero, he's usually everyone's favorite, everyone's rooting for him, and uh, spoiler alert, Blaine doesn't make it, in fact, none of them make it, but but Blaine uh, Blaine's uh, bravado is, is ultimately his downfall, and I'd like to see The Rock do that. I think he'd be fun in that role, he's certainly built for it, and, uh, and then backing him up as George Dillon, the Carl Weathers role, Wesley Snipes because Snipes in his real life now has become as big as some of the characters that he's played, the, the drama that's gone on, the guy did years in prison, but he's out now and he's acting again, and I've seen some of the stuff he's done recently, and he certainly didn't forget how to be a good showman. And, uh, and I think in that role, kind of that older real life gravitas that he brings to it would give us the understanding of this is a guy who has seen it all, he's been through it all, he's been through the Ringer, and he'll be goddamned if this predator is going to be what gets him and his buddies in the jungle. And uh, I think those would be those would be some fun roles. Great, Mike. What's your pick? Uh, Rebecca Ferguson and Wallace Shawn. Now, Rebecca Ferguson from Mission Impossible <laughs> Five, and Wallace Shawn from The Princess Bride. That's a funny p- look. That's you just wanted to see that. Well, yeah, of course I want to see that. <laughs> see that. The thing That's is, side by side. I'd like everyone to take a look at this and then imagine Benicio del Toro and imagine a predator and tell me you don't want to see that. <laughs> I, I, because it's crazy. It would be amazing. I just have one word. Yes. Inconceivable. Of course. <laughs> Willie Lisp. Yeah, I, I think I think probably the thing is Benicio del Toro says inconceivable in the movie is a <laughs> nod to the famous line. That's just off the top of my head. And up to Shane Black. But here, look. Shane Black makes fun movies. I don't know if this is going to be a super fun, like we're not even going to treat anything with stakes. I don't think so. I think he's going to make something that's pretty serious, but also have a spirit of fun. And I want to cast, I want a multi-generational cast. You have somebody who's a little younger. I want to have somebody who's of middle age. And then I want to have somebody who's old, somebody who's like very old and shouldn't be in an action movie that will surprise you. And I'm picking a guy who has been underutilized in film and television forever, Wallace Shawn. Now you're thinking, oh, is he going to be some sort of comedy character? No, Wallace Shawn is going to be a bitter, hardened veteran who's killed many different creatures in space his whole life. He's obviously like an unassuming man, but like very quickly in the movie, you're going to be like, holy shit, Wallace Shawn is kicking ass. Wallace Shawn is killing Predator. 
left and right. And that's what we wanted. That is something, a new way to use one of the greatest characters actors we've ever had. And Rebecca Ferguson, I was just watching Mission Impossible 5, she's awesome. Let's have her in just kind of the new recruit role. Somebody who's like kind of seeing this world for the first time through fresh eyes. And now she's going to be dealing with these two older guys who are very character-y. I think it's going to be awesome. Dan, I wish we could fact check how many times Mike has pitched Wallace Shawn in questions that haven't <laughs> made true. true. <laughs> That's true. Wallace Shawn and uh, what's his name? The, uh, the, the character actor you're quite fond of. Uh, Ed Wynn. Ed Wynn. Ed Wynn. Ed Wynn. <laughs> yes. Yes. You guys have never let me We've never let you do it. It's true. Ever. <laughs> anyway, sorry. In honor of the 100, I had to pull that fact uh-huh. out. All right, yes. but you guys fight. Uh, well, I have an issue with the, calling Benicio Del Toro old because I, I have seen many Heineken commercials, well, really just mm-hmm. one, mm-hmm. and he looks fantastic. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm not saying he doesn't look great. I'm just saying he is older than certainly any of the actors that you pitched. Okay, well, I also think saying that The Rock has never been a dick, I mean, he spent 10 years in the WWE, and his character was entirely a dick. And if you were like me and only know him from his acting work, that is news to me. That's (laughs) shocking. I mean, he's The Rock. He's the people's champ. Sorry. Um, also, I'm also afraid of Wesley Snipes being in this movie because I'm afraid every single time I see Wesley Snipes go on sta- on screen, mm-hmm. I'm just going to be like, hey, it's Wesley Snipes. And I don't want that to distract me from a Predator movie. I think the, I think the Predator <laughs> should be the focal point of the movie, this monster that cuts in and out, not this monster that cuts in and out and then Wesley Snipes shows up. I, I think that is a specious argument. You could say the <laughs> same about literally any very famous actor when you're watching them in a movie. I but he's be, Wesley Snipes. Hey, that's Tom Hanks. True, but that's what's Why don't I do that? Because I give myself over to the magic of the movie for the two hours I'm watching it. I never was able to do that with Wesley Snipes, except for in Blade. I take that back. Then you and I share that. I don't know The Rock as an ass, and you don't know Wesley Snipes as the character he's playing. I don't really know what to say about yours. (laughs) (laughs) Mike, he's pointing at Mike, yeah. Um, Yeah. I mean, at parts of it sound like a comedy. Uh, other parts of it sound like, I mean, just watching, just the idea of watching him kill a bunch of predators alone sounds hilarious. That's why I don't really know how to this feel about like this. sounds like a Shane Black movie mixing comedy and action, and you're not quite the, sure how to completely define it. I think it would be perfect, <laughs> right? <laughs> the problem is, and I love Wally Shawn as much as the next guy, please don't get me wrong, mm-hmm. but the problem is there is a difference between a comedy movie where you know you're watching an absolute comedy so they put the most unlikely of actors in the role of badasses versus when you're watching a movie called Predator which we know is about a very real killing machine this alien and then you have Wallace Shawn who just comically it's not going to be possible to not laugh every time he is in the same frame as this hulking eight foot tall predator especially it's just if he's, going to be laughable in the bad way especially if he's pulling off these moves of just slaughtering predators as you well, said I didn't explain exactly how Wallace Shawn is slaughtering <laughs> predators did. did I? I was saving something <laughs> he is somebody who only he strikes with a pinpoint accuracy he's not punching he's not kicking of course that would be laughable he's a trapper he's a hunter he's a guy that uses is his mind, not his brawn, to trap these predators, okay? And I think we'd all be very surprised seeing Wallace Shawn in a film role like this. No one's ever given him the chance. I think he would make you believe because he's such a good actor. But the movie is called Predator. It's about the predator. Right. They're supposed to be prey. So he's a predator to the predator? Wait, what? <laughs> well, who, who I mean, is- everyone's a predator to the predator in the movie. <laughs> I mean, the, the predator itself is the predator. Everyone else in the movie is the prey. They're they're being hunted. Yes. So he's just everyone. All of them are being hunted except for him, who's hunting the predator. Well, now we're getting into so the plot of the movie, which doesn't exist yet. But in my mind, <laughs> <laughs> they put a team together of guys. Now he's not a guy who necessarily always kills predators. There's other species of alien that this guy has been taking care of. He's like very aliens. Old. Here's like here's it. the problem. Well, yes, that's a. But was, the problem is, it's a team of mercenaries that get assembled to do this. Yes. So, the only way he's on that team not knowing they're about to encounter a predator, which was the plot of the original, I have to assume this is going to follow along the same lines, is if he is some sort of intelligence or explosives expert, and you did not pitch him that way. And so 
it just it strikes me if he's in this scenario, he's going to be the first victim of the predator. He could be the first and victim of the predator. Uh, and but then if he is, what a waste of can Wallace Shawn. Can I just point out that we are still debating whether or not Wallace Shawn would not be ridiculous <laughs> in a predator movie? I couldn't yeah. agree with you more. That was the first thing I said. But we've gone on this. So here's my thing. I don't think either of the actors that you pitched in your movie Cody's. are ridiculous. Yeah. They're both great choices. I just think you and I have different ideas of a predator movie. In mine, they're mercenaries. These guys have seen action. They are decades into their experience, and it's their it is that experience, that veteran nature that allows them to beat the predator, which is essentially what it comes down to in the original. I kind of feel like got, my guys are still age appro- are very age appropriate to be mercenaries. John John Krasinski's yeah. in his mid thirties, and Michael B. Jordan's in his twenties. I mean, they, he yeah. could they could easily both be soldiers and mercenaries, and they both look the part. They they may be, but I I like that there is a that there is this movie I think my version would appeal to a broader audience you get older veterans in there going yeah those fucking young kids don't know how we used to do it back in the day so we need a couple of older guys to show them how it's done and I think that's why the Expendables movies have been so popular is because it's nice to watch older Hollywood actors still kick ass male and female and uh, and I just picked two characters of course there'd be some females in here but I, I, again I don't think yours is a bad movie I like your pitch I just I think the only edge mine might have is that it appeals to a broader audience of slightly older guys still being able to kick ass. The, sh- there's a, the short list in Hollywood, though, we're talking like, you're going to have Michael B. Jordan on. You're going to have Krasinski after the Benghazi thing. You're going to have The Rock on it. And, like, this is this is stuff we sort of expect from a modern action movie. We've seen a lot of these guys. Now, Wesley Snipes, that's he hasn't been around for a while. But, mo- but these choices are pretty safe or pretty familiar. I have somebody who's up and coming, which is Rebecca Ferguson. She's great. And we that's, that's your in. That's your person that we're going to see kick ass that's been effective in other movies. I am picking a guy, though, that's totally... Totally unexpected. I, that's what you want in one of these movies. You don't want to see the same people we've seen every time in any other action movie. All these people are going to be in tons of movies for the next 20 years. The problem for me I, I ultimately is movies. Wallace Shawn being an action star in this movie. And I, I'm i not against it, but I'm only <laughs> for it if the full title is Pride and Prejudice and Predator. <laughs> Because that's then a great it's title. clearly uh, a final comedy. Thoughts, Mike, that is clearly a comedy. That's a great title, first of all, and doesn't have to be a comedy necessarily. Genre is very mysterious. If it you've got Wallace Shawn kicking ass, it is a flat-out comedy. Any other final thoughts, Sam? Uh, no, I stand by everything I've said so far. I Cody, by, final I thoughts? Stand by all I said. I am disappointed in everyone's lack of confidence in Wallace Shawn's acting ability. <laughs> 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 all right. Dan Merle. <laughs> yes, sir. How are, we, how are we doing over there? Well, uh, Benicio Del Toro is 49 years old, just to settle the he age is. debate. Wow. Yes. I didn't say he was he an looks old fantastic. guy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Wallace Shawn, 72 years old. No, I would have gone older for Benicio. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, He's lived a this good would life. be yeah. uh, quite a career move for Michael B. Jordan. This would be the second time he followed Carl Weathers into a franchise. Yes. yes. Oh, uh, wow. Creed and now uh, in a Predator franchise. So that would be interesting. Other than that, I've got a poll result. Uh, other than that, it was a clean round. Based on the pitches and the arguments, I I go back to where you both... I'm going back to the beginning of your arguments because that's where it it stuck to me the most. Uh, And I'll just go right to it. I think Cody explained a little bit better to me as why I liked... uh, I liked... Obviously, Michael, I think you all had somebody who was sort of obvious, but then your second choice was where it was at. And I liked your, he could pull off, Krasinski pull off a soldier, the comedic timing, um, and it felt realistic in Shane's style. Uh, You calling out that The Rock has played the jerk helped, and then the fact that you called out him being, well, he's a predator to a predator, that didn't make sense. So ultimately, those added up enough to give you the slight edge. So Cody got the point. What feature films has The Rock played a jerk in? Uh, he was kind of a jerk in the rundown, wasn't he? Yeah, a little bit. Well, yeah, mm, a little bit. He's the you, hero, though. He was a bully in that. He was kept bullying Sean William Scott. Do you Southland consider the Scorpion Tales? King a jerk? Yeah. Yes, the especially in The Mummy Returns. Jerk there. But then he was in a spinoff movie. I think he was a better guy. He was yeah. better in the spinoff, yeah. yeah. Of course, because he had to turn hero. King, He's though. mostly known as the hero. I'm fighting for the point. Hey, I'm yeah. just curious, because I hadn't seen it. I don't remember. Uh... But anyway, good clean round. Good job, everybody. Uh, the poll was very close. Uh, 46% voted for The Rock and Wesley Snipes. 40% mm-hmm. Michael B. Jordan and John Krasinski. 14%, I'm sorry, Mike. <laughs> 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 We're on board for Rebecca Ferguson yeah. and Wallace Shawn. 14%. Hmm. Uh, I was with you until they started knocking you down. They knocked you down pretty hard. Wallace to be Shawn fair, the poll said R. Ferguson and W. Shawn, so they may not have known who we were talking uh, They probably about. thought They're... Willie Shawn. Yeah, yeah damn. Uh-huh. Oh. Willie Shawn. Round three. 
Uh, this one came in from Groovy Movie News on Twitter. Um, thank you for this one. Um, with all the Disney live action movies coming out, Jungle mm-hmm. Book, Beauty and the Beast, all of them, Cinderella, uh, Groovy Movie News wanted to ask us, what should be the first Pixar movie that should be turned into a live action movie? That's kind of a crazy thought, but at some point it's going to happen, right? We're going to guess. I guess some it has point to. it has to. Maybe it might be 50 years from now, but at some point they're going to turn it into live action. So uh, let's predict the future. Which one do you think is going to be the first and best to be live action? Sam, you're first. Okay. Um, well, I picked the one that I think is, is the most uh, uh, potential our future, and that's Wally. Uh, because uh, it deals with a lot of real-world issues uh, in terms of uh, human beings turning this world into an unlivable trash can and and having to basically escape in a giant ship that floats around in space. It deals with obesity and laziness, and those are very real things that I think we haven't seen in live action, and they would be pretty. Uh, it would be pretty eye-opening to see human beings living that way versus just animated people living that way and uh and then of course uh as wally back on earth uh the multitude uh, uh of of characters this guy has already brought to life through mocap andy circus is playing wally of course uh and he's he's giving that character real emotion in its eyes and its movements and uh and uh, back up on the ship uh you're going to get Jeff Garland to play the captain mm. of the ship himself, uh, voicing uh, the, the character he voiced. But he's going to bring it to real life, uh, not because he's a he's a sloth of a man, but because nobody could do that part better than than I think he could. And um, I'd like to play one of the supporting characters just so that I can gain 150 pounds and tell reason. everyone in my life, no, it's for a role, <laughs> because I think that would just be fantastic. A great like year and a half where I just, mm. you know, what would you eat first? Oh, Krispy Kreme donuts and a lot of in and out. Yeah, all I right. think that's how I'm going down. Sounds great, yep. Mike. What's your uh, what's your live action Pixar pitch? Uh, cars. <laughs> now everyone's gonna laugh here, but <laughs> Cars. Spoiler alert: is not the best Pixar movie. It's not <laughs> a great movie. <laughs> I love it, but it's not a great movie. I think that when you make something uh, from a cartoon from other source material, it's an opportunity to take the material and expand on it, to make it a little bit different, to make it a little bit more interesting, to really class it up, okay? Now, we saw with the Jungle Book, the technology is incredible. Any animals coming to life, which I believe now could be applied to real-life automobiles. Now, I don't want any of the same cast. I want it to be mostly new people, unknowns, uh, also, me, I will be uh, have a role in this as well. Yeah, uh, which that one? That is unrelated to you. Uh, I'll play Mater. Okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to play Do you him. you have a voice? Well, I'm going to play him a little more grounded, and uh, I mean, he's not going to be such a, a car- over-the-top cartoonish character, because obviously this is real life, so we can't go too over-the-top with it. Sure. Um, but I think that you can actually do some really weird, interesting things, and you're gonna people will ne- you've never seen real live car real life cars talk to each other, live in Radiator Springs, which will be recreated. We could also just shoot it at Cars Land at Disney's California Adventure. It would save money. Oh. It would be interesting, and you can actually make cars into a classic. Would you still have the eyes on the cars? The cars have to have eyes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. I hate that movie, The Cars Have Eyes. <laughs> scared the shit out of me when I was a kid. Cody. Um, my pick is uh, the movie that would probably be the most practical to be made into a live-action movie, and that is Up. Um, Up, Up is probably my one of, one of, if not my favorite Pixar movie, right up there with The Incredibles to me. And I think Ed Asner reprises his role because, yes, Ed Asner is still alive. I believe he's 86 years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, put a wig on him, give him some Drew Carey glasses, he'll kill it, just like he did in the movie. I mean, he brought so much character and depth to that just with the voice, and I think Ed Asner would be, of course, the perfect person to play Ed Asner's character. Um, Jordan will be played by Jonathan K. Kwan, short round from Temple of Doom. Mm. He, you know, he might be a little older now, but I still personally think you put him in that uh, Boy Scouts uniform, he won't look a day past 12. Then you got <laughs> Charles Muntz. Charles Muntz, of course, uh, was the villain of the story, the adventurer who became set. Uh, old man, rickety, little mu- little mustache. I think Ted Turner would be fantastic in this role because he looks identical to Charles Muntz. It's 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 uncanny, and uh, you know, Ted Turner playing a psychotic billionaire is not a hard stretch for him. Um, Kevin the Bird. 
You know, I, I, there really wasn't a whole lot of choices, so I obviously went for a live action version. You got to go with Big Bird. I think he would absolutely dominate this role as uh, Kevin the Bird. All he has to do is make that noise over and over again. I think he could pull it off. He's got the acting chops, he's got the resume to really show that he could handle this role. Um, and Doug the Dog. You know, there's a lot of famous golden retrievers out there, um, but none to me has the resume as Airbud. And I think you pull, you get Air Bud out. Not you. Finally, finally, he gets a chance to not do a sports movie. I think it could be a renaissance for his career and for Golden Retrievers everywhere. That's my movie. Then I want to see it, and I think it can happen. All right, I want to hear this, but I, I also want to make sure fact checker Dan Air, over there. Make sure is he dead? He's Who? dead. Air Bud is dead. The original yeah. Air Bud. Well, uh, just do, buddies are alive. I know all of this. I know all of dead. this. Okay. Do the math. Air Bud Go now ahead, has Mike. changed into a different franchise called the Air Buddies, and there are multiple Air Buds. It's become but the a original, puppy mill. Yeah, the original Air Bud has probably been dead fifteen years. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I'm I'm going more of the lighthearted route. <laughs> okay, all um, right. But uh, yeah, let, let's all talk about the dead dog. We let's won't. not. Let's <laughs> go. Or, or, or you can. Right. Now's your turn to fight. Okay. Here's here's what I like to say. I think what separates my pitch from both of of your guys' pitches is. Um, both of your movies rely on some sort of either supernatural or fantasy element. Mm. Um, cars do not actually talk. Cars have never spoken. And in, Dan, in, can you check that? Yeah, please check that, Dan. Uh, and that, if an actual talking car has ever been reported? Yes. yes. Well, yes. Yeah. <laughs> cars that talk to each other in that sense. Mm -hmm. And then also, Cody, in yours, uh, real houses can never be made to float like that with such uh, specificity. Um, it's a movie. I agree. It is a movie. But my movie movie, it is set in reality. It is a live action version of a story that could actually happen since the only elements are robots. So you're you're coming at me about the fact that it's a flying house, but us right now going into space and all is being gluttonous uh, is perfectly fine. It's not that it's fine, it's terrible, but it's totally realistic. And that's what I like out of I think it would be amazing to be able to take a fantastical Pixar movie and turn it into a real movie that is more than just a movie. Wally was a social commentary on where we were headed as a species. We're polluting our planet to the point where we can't even live here anymore, and we're taking such bad care of ourselves as people that we're just going to be floating around in chairs because our legs no longer work. And I think that would be really eye-opening for people to see that, as opposed to either of these movies, which would just be, yeah, okay, fun maybe movies, but my Mine would be fun and interesting and also provide that social commentary in a very realistic way that would resonate with people. These, okay. Sorry. No, please, go ahead. The, uh, these two, these, both these movies sound like the saddest movies that I've ever heard of. Uh, no, Wally uh, has a happy ending. A and short, short round in a Boy Scout uniform? An adult short round in a Boy <laughs> <Yes>. Scout uniform. <laughs> Thank you for reminding 86 me. 86-year-old Ed Asner, which is very close to 90. Which is basically so, exactly the age of the character. But the Pixar, we yeah. can when we render graphics and, and these beautiful images, you can get away with showing things that are horrifying in real life. That's why we look, oh, it's in a beautiful wall, he's on the trash. Think of a 45 minute scene at a real life dump. No, like it would be the life. dumps like in Idiocracy. They weren't scary, but they looked real. Think of a but real they, life car with eyes talking to each other. I'm I'm horrified by this Think concept. about a man that. in his 40s, an Asian American man in his 40s, pretending to be a child. <laughs> now that, my <laughs> friend, that is where you lose scary. me. Fantastic. You, you, you sort of had me on with Ed Asner. Everyone wants to see Ed Asner. Yes, we do. But why not cast a young actor in that role that's because supposed I haven't to be a child? Because I haven't seen Jonathan in 25 years. Okay, it's well time that, to bring him back. Well, that's a person personal thing that I think you can address if, online or at an acting I convention. think I can address it right here. I have a microphone. It's the perfect time to address it this. Is, it's, no, I'm saying you can address seeing Jonathan Kwan in real life. In, in this movie, he would sully what would otherwise potentially be a fun live action version of this movie. And Big Bird? Yes. Big Bird? Absolutely. <laughs> what other no. bird can play that role? You don't need a bird to it's play the action. role. It's live action. You said live action, so we're going live action. You put someone in a bird suit. It, there is someone in a bird suit. It's Big Bird. It's You're, perfect. But you want the actual Big Bird. You bet your from ass I do. Sesame Street. Well, 100%. Now, now you are crossing worlds. You're confusing people. I will say, Cody, this is ridiculous. It, that is, <laughs> okay. You, that is a to ridiculous fair, crossover a between massive, the Goonies and Sesame Street. I don't I'm know. Non-stop. No, no, no. I never ran for the Goonies. I only mentioned uh, Temple okay, of Doom. Okay, fine. Temple of Doom, yeah. then. Okay, real quick. There, the major difference between my pitch and their pitches is I didn't shamelessly cast myself in my movie. 
which both of you did. Mine was not shameless. I just want to be one of the extras mine floating was, around in a chair. Mine was shameless, but it's because I would do the best job of any actor in Hollywood. <laughs> And also, you're not an actor, Cody. You can't Wrong. put yourself in the movie. Wrong, I have two IMDb credits. All right, all right, all right. All right. The, the first ten minutes of uh, Make Everyone Very Sad. I couldn't now, agree with you more. Now, imagine an 86-year-old Ed Asner, Ed Asner reenacting the ten <laughs> minutes of that movie. People will be leaving. They will be so sad. They will be driving their car into traffic after that. I, I roundly agree. I roundly minutes. agree. And not good sad. And sad, sad. Bands. And like young makeup. Yes. Yeah. And then the last they half would... of Wally, where everyone is just like, oh, and like just grotesque. People are going to be so depressed after these two movies. It would be like watching uh, the the Honey Boo Boo show. That's but, how fat but, people but, are oh, already. No. Honey Boo Boo we are show. familiar with it. All right, here's what last round here, last last points. Tell me again, play me a scene from your live action movie that makes it better. Why is it better to be live action? Because this is what movie should be made in the live action. Because Go mine ahead, is a social commentary, not in a in a negative way, but in a way where I don't think we've ever seen it. We've seen it animated, where the animators gave us a very rosy view of, hey, if you guys don't shape up, this is what's going to happen to Earth, and this is what's going to happen to us as a people. And this way, I'm not saying it's going to be scary, it's just going to be in a way I don't think we've seen before, where you're going to watch the Earth truly being a <laughs> trash can, and you're going to see people floating around in chairs going, Jesus. Jesus, that looks fun for a day, but not be, to not be able to walk and feed myself properly anymore, we have to do something about ourselves as a species and the planet. Great. Cody, what scene or part makes yours worthy as live action? Um, just the, the whole idea of the uh, house being in the air and has their <laughs> <laughs> opening the door and you see short round in the corner. Short <laughs> round! <laughs> Jonathan Kwan is in his 40s! <laughs> It's not what? Clifford. What's wrong it. with you? It sounds amazing. I want to see it now. No. All right. <laughs> Mike. Mockery of a Pixar Mike. classic. I think that with the advent of modern technology, uh, oh especially with seeing Jungle Book, <laughs> you can now do incredible things and make things that cannot talk talk in a realistic way. <laughs> Okay, I think that there's something strange about the CGI in the Cars movies. I think now technology is finally caught up, and we're going to see an interesting, unique take on the Cars franchise. For instance, the scene where they go to Radiator Springs <laughs> Racer oh boy. at Disney's California Adventure. It's going to add a new dimension to see this stuff happening in real life. Also, in my movie, they explain where all the humans went, and they all died of something. <laughs> <laughs> That's the pressing itself! What the... <laughs> Wow. Wow. I, I thought, You're not really allowed to Ours were depressing. You know, point of parliamentary procedure. You're not allowed to bring new evidence into your closing argument, yeah. but. Right under well. the buzzer, boys. <laughs> that was well. slick. That was that's, slick. That's technically That's illegal. why I've done the show 17 times. Yeah. All right, Dan Merle. He's got it in under the wire. Yeah. Uh, well, there was one live action character in Wally. That was Fred Willard. He was the first live action uh, person in a Pixar film. All right. Jonathan Kwan is 45 years old. Yeah. I looked at some pictures. I can say he does look older than 12 years old. <laughs> Cub Scout uniform or no Cub Scout uniform. And listen, it came up. Buddy the Wonder Dog. <laughs> <laughs> he also played Comet on the show Full House. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Passed away in 1998 at 10 years old. Oh, so the original the silence ten? for Buddy. The yeah. original he was only 10? He, had, he got sick. Did oh. they work him to death? He was a bigger dog. He got sick anyway. So, no, he has oh, sadly sad. not been with us for quite he was some probably time. All right, a quick too. moment of silence Sorry. for Buddy. For Buddy the Wonder Dog. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I poured them oh, for my homies. <laughs> One for your homies. Uh, anything else, Dan? <laughs> and I've got the poll. We're going to start an electrical fire. Also, whenever you'd like to see it. Man, uh, I mean, adult short round, I, as fun as it is to you, that just seems <laughs> horrific for, <laughs> for him. So you're out, Cody. Uh, I was really pulling for you, Mike, and then you did throw that last bit in. So, wow, they're all the humans are dead. I want to learn more. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think Sam, sadly, had probably the most realistic there pitch. So Sam's... Still got the point, Thank but you, you were very close there, Mike. Nice, nice trick at the end. Yeah. Thank you. All right, round four. Yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, oh, the so Twitter poll was 45% set up. 40% said Wally. Mike, I'm sorry. 15% said <laughs> Wally. You've hit, you hit a ceiling today, I just, Mike. I'm so we'll talk about it in but how is it different than <laughs> <the> ours? 
<laughs> I saw Cars twice. It was awful. I mean, they're already made. The effects are were upgraded in Cars two, weren't yeah, they? I'm, enough? I'm not very much. <laughs> <laughs> it's very curious, but I still couldn't figure it out. Anyway, all right, round four. <sighs> this one comes. There it is again. This one comes from our, uh, Travis of Marvel, uh, longtime fan of the show. He wants to know. Uh, it's sports season. Yeah. I guess yes. every season, but football season is gearing up. We have a professional baseball player here. Yeah, I and that. I know we got some guys here who actually can talk sports. It happens once in a while. Uh, but this is a fun one. Pitch us a sports movie where the team and coach are played by other movie characters. That's a crazy weird one, yeah, right? Yeah, it's very weird. <laughs> that seems like a Mike question. So, Mike, why don't you start? Okay, Pitch well. us a sports movie where the team and coaches are other movie characters. All right. Um... I've always wanted to see a lot of different gods team up um, because they're powerful and I want to see how they would get along. So I am going to pitch you right now an underused sport, I feel, in movies, tennis. I would like to see The Rock's Hercules team up with Chris Hemsworth's Thor in a tennis movie where they play, oh, there they are, they play Hades. Oh, Oh yeah. yeah. Also, that sort of I, already in the, it kind of gives it away that Thor, of course, plays with his hammer. That's a thing I was going to reveal <laughs> later, maybe at the very end before the buzzer. Um, but they have new a new tactic for the next yeah, new, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's immoral. They have a very it's very uh, unethical. They have a very uh, interesting coach, uh, played by George Burns, reprising his role as God from the hit film Oh God with the exclamation point. But not Oh God. Part you two. devil. No, no, no. First one. <laughs> oh, God. First Book two, I believe. Yeah, no. I want to throw out the continuity of the Oh, God series and throw number two <laughs> out and keep it fresh for number okay. one. Um, and I'm just going to call it Tennis Gods, because why wouldn't you? Okay. Okay. Tennis Gods. Cody, you're up next. Cody's very confused. Um, okay. Okay. <laughs> Andy, I, by, by that pitch. Andy, uh, I am aware you're not a huge sports fan, so mm -hmm. do uh, do your best to follow me on okay. this, please. Yeah. Um, there is something that happened in 2007. My movie is based on a true story. In 2007, there was the Fiesta Bowl football, where the Boise State Broncos took on the Oklahoma Sooners. Boise State had zero business playing the Oklahoma Sooners. So here is my story. Boise, based on a true story follows the heartwarming true story about the undefeated Cinderella season of the Boise State football team that culminated with an underdog, borderline truly unrealistic victory against a far superior Oklahoma Sooners in the Fiesta Bowl. The story mostly follows head coach Chris Peterson, played by Gordon Bombay of the Mighty Ducks. While battle battling his alcoholism, he also is trying to rally his team of misfits together who he knows won't be taken seriously in the eyes of Division I football. The other main characters are quarterback Jared Zabransky, played by Star-Lord from Guardians of the Galaxy. A good quarterback who is now a fifth-year senior with a chip on his shoulder for never being taken too seriously because he plays at Boise State. So in turn, whether or not he takes this job seriously anymore. And star running back uh, Ian Johnson, played by Adonis Creed from Creed who is a top gun running back who is battling with his football ego and his tumultuous relationship with his girlfriend who is the head cheerleader who is played by Harley Quinn from Suicide Squad. Whoa. Hmm. The final Fiesta Bowl game is the culmination of a dream to make this misfit school a contender in the eyes not only in Division I football but in America itself because this is a nationally televised game. Um, that leads to an emotional victory using trick plays and a last-second Statue of Liberty play. That is a trick play that is doesn't work in kids' football, by the way. Does it work in real football? It worked in this game. It was ridiculous. Statue of Liberty play for the victory. With this validation, Ian, played by Adonis Creed, proposes to his head uh, cheerleading girlfriend, Harley Quinn, on national TV, leading to a slow-motion ending with the team hoisting them and the trophy up in the air for a freeze frame ending into the final credits with Tina Turner's Simply the Best playing us out of the theater. Simply the best! All right. Better Cue the tears. The All right. Sam, your turn. Okay. Uh, I don't know that I have 100% understood the question because I didn't. No, 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 it's fine. I didn't create an original movie. I took an existing sports movie and existing sure. characters. So you're remaking a movie. I'm remaking a movie. Okay. And the title of this movie is. The Hunt for the Rookie of the Year. 
because uh, it's the it's the remake of Rookie of the Year, the <laughs> beloved uh, sports movie uh, featuring uh, my my beloved Chicago Cubs, uh, and uh, the manager, the coach of the team this time, is none other than Marco Ramius, Sean Connery from The Hunt for Red October. Oh, yeah. He's a no nonsense guy. Uh, and so we're the, bringing him out of retirement. We're bringing him out of retirement. Well, but technically, I'm 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 using it's the, a, okay, it's yeah, a yeah. fictional character sure. we're all using here. So Marco Ramius is still around, and uh, you know he's living in America now after he defected. So he needs a job. Uh, so he's going to manage the Chicago Cubs, and uh, and as far as the players on the team, I've decided to go with uh, a little selfishly here. Uh, the cast of Inglorious Bastards, mm. and I'll tell you why. It was a very easy. Okay, I didn't need. I did not ask them to use a picture of me, um, <laughs> but this was an easy sell because right there in Donnie Donowitz, you've got the bear Jew with a bat, and boy oh boy, does he know how to use that thing. But of course, everybody knows the the star of Rookie of the Year is the rookie himself because he has that freak accident and he can pitch. And uh, the the star uh, pitcher with a, a freak accident in this version is Bridget von Hammersmark, played by Diane Kruger. That's right, a lady on a major league ball club. Here's mm-hmm. looking at you, Fox Network. They've mm-hmm. got a show coming out called Pitch about that. Anyway, oh, looks so terrible. Um, yep. And so uh, so Bridget von Hammersmark, her leg. As you know, was was wounded badly in Inglorious Bastards, but it's healed up in such a way that it gives her such tremendous force in pushing off of the mound that oh, she yeah. can whip 105 mile an hour fastballs. Now, Cody, I can already see is writing that down because as a as a ball player, he's going to tell me that that has nothing to do. But clearly, this is a fantasy movie. Cody, save that argument. Save it. It's a fantasy movie, and in mine, pushing off of the mound allows you to throw harder. No Tommy John surgery for her. So then you've got the rest of the bastards filling out the uh, the nine man roster, the nine man uh, 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 lineup, and uh, and I'm there basically as uh, as you know ball boy because I'm not I'm not big enough. Uh, but uh, the rest of those bastards, you got your Hugo Stiglitz, uh, you got your uh, Aldo Rain. Those guys, that's they're going to make a mean baseball lineup and under the direction of uh, Marco Ramius as their manager, of course, they win the World Series and it's uh, it's going to be a hell of a picture. Wow. I, uh, I, first of all, I would like to mention that also in my movie reprising the role as boyfriend and girlfriend from the Allstate commercial me and the girl playing, so we'll be both in this as well, and we'll be, we'll be angels also. Could I uh, right away mention in my pitch I didn't cast myself again? You, you should have, maybe. Maybe, I might as well at this point. I just point. happened to be in Inglorious Bastards. I would have used them even if I weren't in the movie. Sure. Um, your, your story, your one confuses me because I honestly don't know what Mike's. the movie's about. Mike, I, well, and, and I can clear it up. It's a simple story of uh, God, which is George Burns, wagering with the devil. He's had a long history with this guy they're playing cards one night and he goes I bet my boys could beat your boys in a tennis match he puts the two guys together they team up it's a bunch of misadventures while they're trying to get it together wait and boys finally, is there more than one person per no, team no just, uh, oh, it's, it's, just well, my it's, boys. it's a doubles so, it's doubles. so they're playing doubles yes okay. it's, it's mm. Hercules and it's Thor teaming up against Hades and the devil so is it a doubles oh, tournament or is it just, it's just one, one on one one, one match oh, like, uh, like it's Billy, a full Billy set Billy and Bobby full set like a like, uh, like an exhibition game of sorts? Yes, exactly. And now mm. instead of though tennis, we're not do it's not balls, it's planets. There's lightning, oh, there's souls. No, no, okay. No, well, no, well, here's no, the thing. No. That's just impractical to use as a tennis ball. Uh, secondly, there were other two tennis movies that you forgot. I mean, Match Point was a very popular movie and so was Wimbledon. <laughs> Wait, um, match point. Yeah. I don't there's virtually no <laughs> tennis at all. They in were match in point. there and they played tennis. I think there's more sexual intercourse in the rain. Uh, yeah, than but this match is a well, that's, that's, that's everything. Yeah, well, I'm for a sports movie. And, well, neither. okay, then what about Wimbledon? That does not qualify as a sports movie. How either. does Wimbledon not qualify as a sports it's movie? It's mostly talking. There's a lot of talking. <laughs> but most sports movies are mostly talking. I disagree. Mine has lots of action on the field. Y- yours has has Sean Connery from Hunt for Red October. And by the way, I would hate playing for that guy. That sounds oh, awful. No way. He's oh, no so nonsense. Hard. I know. You you need to have some fun in your manager. If the guy's no nonsense, the but players you're, bring the you're, fun. You're a, you're a you're a Cubs guy, yeah. Joe Madden. Do you think he's a no-nonsense guy? Uh, this is a fictional world. Oh, <laughs> come on. And also, uh, yeah, you, there was a little bit of pitch in there, and I, you, you were right. I was I writing know, I down. Me, I know. <laughs> That's not how that works. I know it's not how it works, Cody, but this is a fictional movie. But then why doesn't she like kick the ball or throw the ball with her magical she does, leg? Her arm's not broken in Bastards. Her leg is broken. I needed something to tie in with the Rookie of the Year broken, broken bone heel. 
Now, these are disparate characters getting together, okay? My characters oh, make boy. sense together. Disparate characters, it's going to be like the cartoon all-stars to the rescue Yours, where you got Garfield talking and it doesn't make any I, sense. It's not going to tonally feel. There are being played as tennis here. balls. The loss of life in these planets I mean, oh, it's an epic scale. It's and an epic. No, no, and losing no, no, potential no, no. planets and for terraforming purposes. No, 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 no. There are so many planets in the solar system, many of them uninhabited by any sort of are, life. Are you, is this going to end with everyone on Earth is dead? Earth has Earth. No, Earth. It ends with Earth celebrating our mighty gods winning now, against the forces of evil. Neither of us have really mentioned anything about Cody's movie, and I think I know why. And Cody, this is no reflection on you as a writer. Mm -hmm. College football is so forgettable unless you love college football. That's it's such a forgettable that is, premise. That could not be less true. The program is a phenomenal and rememberable movie. Necessary Roughness is maybe one of the best football movies right, ever made. Right, right, right. So you're That's, telling me those are not forgettable. I could no, sit around and quote Robert Loja the entire movie right now. I believe I said those are forgettable if you don't love college football. I don't I love, don't college, love fo college football. I neither do I. I and I and I understand it's a huge thing, and I'm not saying that it's not a a huge huge thing on its own, but unless you love college football, I don't know that that movie is going to appeal to you. If you don't I love baseball, barely, you're not going to go see a Rookie of the Year movie. Oh, I disagree. I mean, I disagree. It's a family movie, and that put lots of asses in seats, more so than, oh, it's a movie about baseball. One, my movie is also the only one here that is actually based on a true story, oh, as so is many, mine. many sports movies so that mine. are popular World, that World are. War II happened, so did the Cold War. Wait a second. Are yep. you doing Rookie of the Year? Are you doing Inglorious Bastards? I'm doing all of them. I mean, I got to hit And the stuff. Cubs are about to win the I World Series, so what are you going to do? For movies that we've sort of sort of seen before. This is a movie we've now my movie is a movie we've never seen. This is wild. There is a reason, reason, reason we haven't seen, 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 seen that movie. There is a good reason. <laughs> Final thought. Go ahead, Mike. This is going to be literally the crazy, most epic sports movie of all time. I think that just sounded like I was Hal Rudnick there. It doesn't sound like a <laughs> What movie. court are they going to play on? Oh, uh, the galaxy uh. is the court. <laughs> <laughs> what, what court? There's no... Uh, there is no space landscape. Is a vacuum. Right. There is there no, no your final terrorist. thoughts, Mike? Lightning. <laughs> just leave it at that. Gal just say nebulas, lightning. Nebulas. Nebulas. Oh, Ball, balls going through nebulas coming out. This is going to be the craziest, wildest, most heady sports event ever. It's going to be fun, guys. Uh, my, my movie, A, no one mentioned uh, all the characters that I brought in. Gordon Bombay as a manager, as the head coach would be perfect, as you've already seen his acumen of coaching a m group of misfits in uh, Mighty Ducks. Adonis Creed, uh, already perfection plays this part character to a T. Um, and when this actually happened, I'm not a huge college football fan, but I watched this game just by chance, and it was like I was watching a movie. It was I couldn't believe what I was watching. It was magical, and all I kept saying to myself is, I cannot wait for this movie. It hasn't happened yet. I want it to happen now. I believe that there's a reason it hasn't happened yet, because it's, it's not a memorable thing that appeals to a broad enough audience. It definitely has an audience, just not a broad enough audience, as opposed to the great American pastime known as Major League Baseball, which has a very broad appeal. And the characters that I mentioned, none of them are known as professional athletes. I'm taking, it's a fish out of water story. It's, you got, it's got a little bad news bears quality but to you, it. But you're telling me that it's a family-friendly movie it and is. it's about Nazi killers. No, 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 no. They're not Nazi killers on the field. They're ballplayers. Dan. Yes. Whew. So much to unpack. Yeah. I am to be list Wimbledon as a comedy slash romance slash sports film, so mm. yeah, it's up in the air. Mm. Um, you said that this is sports season. Technically, every season in the U.S. is sports season. There are mm -hmm. sports year-round here <laughs> in the U.S. This is a season that contains a lot of sports, though. Football season. Definitely. Uh, George Burns Passed away in 1996. That's, but Mike's... He lived two years, years old. Yes. He lived, uh, he didn't live to see the death of <laughs> Buddy the dog. Uh, he did not. <laughs> he did not. And the football game that Cody's describing was the January 1st, 2007 Tostitos Fiesta Bowl between the Boise State Broncos and the Oklahoma Sooners. As a college football fan, a game that I, to this day, remember watching. Uh, often regarded as one of the best college football games ever played. So, that's it. Mm. Oh, man. Do we have a poll? How do, do we fit that in a Twitter poll? Well, the poll just says, like, Sam's pitch, Mike's okay. pitch, Cody's pitch. But I do have a poll. Me. Yes, I do have a poll. Did so I get I at least 12%? Can... We'll see in a second. All right. I mean, wow. This is a <laughs> weird question, well, for one. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how to unpack all this because there's so much there. You guys did pitch me some creative ideas, but surprisingly, <laughs> the most unsensical person said the thing that made the most sense, which is... 
his characters make the most sense together. Hmm? And that was Mike Carlson. And <laughs> that epic scale. I mean, no way. That sounds oh. pretty awesome. And you wouldn't oh. see those guys together. They're all gods. I mean, why is Star Lord with see, Creed? This is and why, why you is can't the glorious pitch sports bastards? movies to a giant nerd. Well, nah, glorious bastards with Sean Connery. None of it made any damn sense. <laughs> and so, since he pointed Some... that out, I got to give Mike the point. Thank you. Yes. Sometimes I am silly on movie fights, but that is a legitimate movie oh, I mean, that I, I would like to see. <laughs> Sometimes I'm silly, but that's not being silly. You have got to be shitting me! Cody, that was... <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's how it works sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, how'd the poll go, Dan? Well, the audience at home shares your confusion about this round. Many people, <laughs> sports fans and not sports fans alike, don't know what to make of this round. I, wild. I'm happy to say that 49% of our Twitter poll voted for Mike's pitch. Wow! 30% voted for Cody, 21% for Sam. There you go. Thank you. That's Finally, right. they reaffirmed my choice. Yeah, there it really is. Did. I what guess is got wrong a, with that? We've got, we got, got a lot of Cardinals fans <laughs> That's voting the on the poll today. That's the biggest so far of yes, all the yes. rounds. Was you, that you, pitch? You made a point of nothing made sense. Somehow Mike Carlson's it's pitch it was made the most idea. sense it's, that round, Dan. How weird was that? I, it, <laughs> listen. It's because he knows his audience. Yes. This is not a sports viewing audience. And this has nothing to do with sports. <laughs> Cody hasn't even put his hey, headphones back on. He's so shocked. Cody's was a mixture of, fan, of fiction and reality. <laughs> fiction. Sam's was a remake, kind of. Uh, in a weird way, I think Mike's did kind of make the most sense. I did, I, but I, I did. love how. Yeah, we'll get more water. Tell me I love how. Uh, I love how passionate you guys were, though. That was fantastic. All right, last round here. That means it's still anybody's game. Mike and Cody, you're tied by one to one. Sam, you got two, so you're automatically in the finals. Oh God. <laughs> round five. Here we go. This comes from this our one. very. Uh, he was on the fan cam a while back. Troy Luxon. Uh, he had a great Ooh. fight in honor of the 100 episodes. Troy wants to ask, um, what was the best film that, what is the best film that will stand the test of time 100 years from now? You can pick any movie. You can pick any movie from today, from 100 years ago, but what movie could we say today is safe to assume will be uh, stand the test of time 100 years from now? So what year is that? 2000 and... 2116. No 2116. Thank you. That was should have been way easier. Should have been easier. <laughs> wow. All right. You're still thinking about college football? Yes, still thinking about it. Yeah. Cody, you're first. I'm sorry, I can't believe that last Get over happened. it. I, I'm moving, moving on. on. Moving on. Moving on. Yeah, My pick is Casablanca. Uh, I, I believe I do have the oldest pick of anyone else's picks here. 1942. Casablanca starring Humphrey Bogart, uh, Ingrid Bergman. I, I feel as though having this movie already. To, from 1942 to 2016, it already la lasts, almost going to last 100 years now. And it, it sits so well on its own. It has such rich characters. It has a phenomenal love story that is a also you know a love triangle story along with uh, the character um, uh, Victor Laszlo. You know, it's, it has everything. It has romance. It has comedy. It has absolute fantastic drama. And it has memorable characters. And, and to me... A movie that really lasts the test, stands the test of time is a movie that has memorable, memorable characters. And this is the only movie that so far has shown that it has lasted the test of time. And I think it can last another 100 years, 200 years, because it tells a story that doesn't feel dated. It doesn't even look dated. For a movie that's in black and white, um, you know, M Michael Curtis put together a phenomenal movie. Uh, the, all the way down to its motifs, using shadowing, uh, lighting. You know, it doesn't have the the luxury of using color as most movies do uh, it's it's just to me the best movie ever made in my eyes all right sam what are you picking uh okay i have gone with what i consider probably to be the greatest film ever made the godfather and the reason i think that this film stands head and shoulders above any other film on any list afi bfi both of which by the way call the godfather the greatest movie ever made on various years depending on who's voting um the thing about this movie that makes it so great is it is all about the characters. It is all about the way human beings interact with each other, dealing with the greatest themes in our lives. Love, betrayal, revenge, lust, uh, family, above all else, family, separating business from personal, things that everyone has to deal with regardless of culture, regardless of age, regardless of knowledge of historical facts, 
and, 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 and things like that. These are things everyone encounters on a daily basis. I believe these are themes that everyone in every culture can relate to. And I think 100 years from now, that movie will absolutely still relay those themes just as flawlessly. And it is a movie that everyone can get something out of, especially its spectacular storytelling. Mike. Um, I will say that those two are very, they're great movies. Um, and people of a certain sophistication, like, uh, will appreciate them. I, however, do not have faith that human beings will be smarter than we are now. In fact, <laughs> I believe the opposite. Because the way we've been going, it seems like everything is going straight to hell. So I'm going to pick something that does not rely on character, theme, motivation, cinematography. Well, cinematography. Something that, that you have to have a sort of a knowledge of film or human relations to understand. I'm picking Charlie Chaplin's The Gold Rush. Oh, I thought you were going to say Air Bud. <laughs> that would have been great. That's certainly a good option. <laughs> and I can argue for that if we want me to pivot. But I will stick with this. This is a movie, and I'm going to go with the, the... There was a version of it where he like overdubbed and like added dialogue. But I'm going with the original one. There's no dialogue. It's just basically... There's some writing here and there. But it's basically just... It's gags. It's reading his face. There's a little heartbreak in it. It's very easy. Like a child can understand it. It's like a perfect Looney Tunes cartoon before Looney Tunes came out. Because honestly, when we say stand the test of time, in 100 years there have to be people around to appreciate an interesting movie. I think this is idiot proof. I think the people in idiot Idiocracy would like the Gold Rush. <laughs> There's no telling if they would even understand Casablanca or The Godfather. Wow. Interesting take there. What do you guys think? My, my issue with the gold rush is, what year did the gold rush come out? 1930s? No, no, no. 1940s? 20s. 20s? 20s? 1920s? Okay, so that's already 100 years ago, almost 100 years ago, and mm -hmm. no one's talking about the gold rush. In fact, that you bringing up the gold rush is the first time someone's actually mentioned the movie Gold Rush to me <laughs> in my life. Um, also, your lack of faith in mankind is sad. Yes, um, it is. Um, as <laughs> yeah. for, I agree. I am sad all the time. Although, I want to say I do love Gold Rush. But I, sure? I, I don't see it lasting another hundred years and being dug out of the vaults mm -hmm. and all of a sudden becoming a masterpiece mm -hmm. uh, to the next generation. I want to hear you argue against The Godfather, Cody. <laughs> I'm, I'm on the edge of my seat. Absolutely. Uh, the Godfather, wonderful movie. Absolutely wonderful movie. But the, Enough said. Hold on. Hold on. You just said, uh, you mentioned all the emotions and mm -hmm. character themes mm -hmm. and the arcs that were dealt with in yes. Godfather. Yes. My movie did the exact same thing with every single one of them, only it did it 35 years earlier. So I feel as though my movie is already showing that it's lasting the test of time longer than yours has. Now, I'm not saying that it won't last the test of right. time in 100 years. Right. Uh, it's hard to argue that either of the, any three of these movies wouldn't last the test of time. But Casablanca had motifs that were used in The Godfather. I mean, sure. I mean it's, it was a template for cinema. I mean, right. I feel as though Ca Casablanca to this day is probably the most, one of the most referenced movies both in scope, story, uh, plot devices, mm -hmm. and it, 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 it's a movie that even has a famous quote that was never even said in the movie in Play It Against Sam. An entire another movie and play was made about it. Uh, Woody Allen made Play It Against Sam, an entire movie about Casablanca. I mean, mm -hmm. I it's feel a shame so, there are no memorable lines from The Godfather. But I didn't say there weren't memorable lines. I'm just saying my your movie did all these things. Right. Mine did it first 35 years That's earlier. That's exactly correct. It did it 35 years earlier, and here is my argument to that. There is a problem that... Uh, that is, it keeps coming back again and again and again whenever the AFI releases their list or the BFI releases their list, um, and that is the nostalgia factor when people talk about the golden age of Hollywood and those movies, and they are turning a blind eye to the fact that those movies were made under a code where they were not allowed to curse, they were not allowed to explore real adult themes and storylines, and I believe that that counts against those movies Movies in the long scheme, looking at a hundred years of storytelling that is looking at it through a very, very narrow spectrum. Whereas you take a movie like The Godfather, which I believe represents a peak of creativity and comfortability with audiences knowing what they were seeing and being able to explore those themes from a different, not as safe angle. And that is why it is such an important movie because it took everything that we learned from Casablanca in terms of storytelling and improved it and brought it to the next level. And I believe when people talk about movies not being as good as they used to be, I don't think they mean Casablanca. They mean The Godfather. They mean the movie making of the 70s when it was no holds barred, when people 
people were making movies that told stories that connected with everyone. And I believe 100 years from now, that is going to be a much more powerful movie when people see it versus Casablanca, which to be fair, you do need to have some pretty good knowledge of World War II and what that meant to the world to really fully appreciate that movie. Whereas The Godfather, I believe those themes completely stand on their own. I don't feel as though it does, you do need any knowledge of it because it actually explains it with the first 10 minutes of exposition of the movie. I mean, you are told everything you need to know about Casablanca, and you're right, the movie was slightly more handcuffed than The Godfather was. Yeah. And in doing so, it made a extraordinarily memorable movie that's already lasting the test of time. And you were talking about quotes. Yes, of course, Godfather has a bunch of quotable, yeah. but so does, I mean, Casablanca just has as many, if not more. I They're mean, both quotable. Mike, I mean, chime in here. What do you think? Well, I, I, look, it's the, the question that I'm arguing uh, is on a hundred years. Where are we going to be in a hundred years? If you show a child, if you show a seven-year-old all three of these movies, he's going to like The Gold Rush the best of those. Yeah, but so that I'm, wasn't the question here. In a hundred years, what will a seven-year-old find the most memorable? I am expecting most human beings to be like a seven-year-old. Oh, I mean, okay. that's sort of what. <laughs> <laughs> that's sort of the way our movies are going. That's sort of the way a lot of entertainment is going, and that's sort and that's literally what I think as far as idiocracy. I'm just saying, what is the sure bet of the three of these? Because these are good movies, but we don't even know in a hundred. Like, I don't. I'm not even confident we'll be speaking the same language in a hundred years. Like, things are moving and declining so Wait, rapidly. Does, does anyone else share that concern? No, um, I do not think we're going in that direction, Mike. I gotta, I gotta right, disagree well, with you there good. politely. I mean, if, if this was a and, question on where humanity will be in a hundred years, you'd be destroying this. But I, I you. don't think. Dan, I hope you're looking up some facts of some futurist, uh, <laughs> futurist, <laughs> futurist? I mean, um, those aren't facts. But again, I, I, I just want to point out that all, all three of these movies are classic movies and hard to argue against, but right. I just, it's just which one's better, and I just personally feel that Casablanca would be better. I understand, better. and that is, and that is, you're uh, free to have that as your personal belief, and I personally believe, uh, that the movies of the golden age of Hollywood helped to inform filmmakers and once the codes were released, once they were the restrictions were released and they were able to make those movies more gritty, more intense, more, more real, that's a movie that I think will resonate over the test of time much longer than Casablanca. I just feel like with The Godfather, how great it is, without Casablanca, you don't get to The Godfather. Yeah, but we have both. True. All right, they both got last one little comment. Mike, are you all done? I'm done. All right, Dan. Yes. Any thoughts to add? The Gold Rush was made in 1925. It currently is mm. sitting at the number 130 spot on the IMDb Top 200. It was ranked at number 58 on AFI's 2007 list of the 100 greatest films of all time. Uh, Play It Again, Sam, is actually not a quotation from Casablanca. It's a misnomer. It's a misquote. Mm -hmm. uh, Woody Allen made a movie called Play It Again, Sam, and, and it was a Broadway show, but the line Play It Again, Sam is not yeah. actually in the movie right. Casablanca. Right. Yeah. Most people think it is. Right. It's, like, it's not. like Luke, I am your father. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, that's it. Also, I'm sorry, one more thing. To everybody on Twitter, and there's a lot of Movie Fights Live saying that they never bothered to watch Casablanca, go watch it. It's one yeah, of the best great. movies ever made. Sorry. That's not meant to sway you, Andy. It's just a lot of people are like, eh, I never bothered to they see should it. Watch all three it's of one these of the, you should watch all three sure. of these yes. movies, but Casablanca's great. They're all great. Uh, oh. Man, that was a good bass sound. <laughs> yeah, really. This is tough, because those are all three great movies. And and I got to say, Mike, you made a strong argument there. What if we're all brain-dead idiots in 100 years? You that know. said, that's all you gave me. If you'd given me one more thing, I might have been swayed. I was, I was, you, you got, you buttered me up at the beginning, but then it didn't go there. Yeah. So it did come down to Cody and Sam, and man, Sam slayed it there at the end. I mean, that whole bringing that whole movies couldn't be what they were. It, it just, it sadly overweighed what you had. I, while they're both classic movies, that gave me a little bit of extra inch. So I got to give Sam the point. So that puts Sam really far in the lead. And uh, Mike and Cody are at one on one. That means we have to do a tiebreaker, which mm -hmm. is so fun on a 100th episode, to see which one is going to go to the finals against him. So let me break out a tiebreaker here. Here we go. Uh, you guys know how this works. You both played yes. the speed round before. I I'll assume be, I'm sitting this one safe. out. You're safe. You're safe. This is just a tie. Right. Hey, check you my check, your, check your, 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 your game. Yep. Um, <laughs> you guys will be uh, chiming in quick. Uh, yep. If you say the same thing, whoever said it first will be mm -hmm. able to choose that one. You'll have to pick the person who didn't. will have to pick another answer. You'll have 20 seconds and then 10 seconds. Right, Dan? Rebuttal? Uh, I believe it's 20 and 10. 20 yes. and 10. Okay, great. <laughs> sure. Let's go with that. Yeah, whatever. Here we go. <sighs> Wayne's World or Austin Powers? Austin Powers. Wayne's World. Okay. 
So, sorry. You said, Mike said Austin Powers. Austin Powers, that's right. Okay, I, I went to write it and then I lost my train of thought. Cody got Wayne's World. Great. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, I heard Mike first. So, Mike, you're up. Uh, Austin Powers was a phenomenon. These are, of course, great, both great, great movies. But Austin Powers was something that built and slowly built, and all of a sudden we had a second movie that made just millions of dollars. It started a three-person, fr a three-picture franchise. Then we ended up getting the Love Guru, which I like to think is a fourth Austin Powers. Those are bad things. But Austin Powers itself is a great movie. It's the height of Mike Myers' comedic genius. It is something the pinnacle. Okay, Cody. Wayne's World was a movie that was based on characters that he actually created, where uh, Austin Powers was ba was just a knockoff on James Bond and in like Flint. So it was more of just parody movies, endlessly parodying something else, where it, Wayne's World was made on its own merit, its own characters that were built and rich, and they were able to, you know, tie in a good story with it. And it was a lot of fun, a lot more fun, more, just as many memorable characters. Uh, All right, time starts when you begin talking, Mike. You got 10 seconds final here. Uh, Wayne's World is also just Bill and Ted, and it's just slightly tweaked around, so it's not a completely original idea, but Austin Powers created a phenomenon. Wayne's World is a sleeper hit. Austin Powers is the funnier movie between the two of them. 10 seconds final. I don't think it's a it's anything to do with Bill and Ted. There is no time travel whatsoever. There is no no even remote closeness to that story. Um, it's I think it's the better movie. Just gone. Whew. Man, that's actually really rough there. Uh, Dan, any thoughts based on what you heard as I'm processing? Ooh. They made a, they both made yeah. really, really good arguments. Um, this is tough. If I had to tip it one way or the other, I might tip it slightly in favor of Mike. I felt like he gave me more reasons of why Austin Powers was superior. Yeah, I'd go slightly in favor of Mike on that one. Yeah, I mean, I'm going through. Uh, you Mike talked about the franchise. You, Cody made a good point about the built rich original character, but then well, I think he meant just the characters in general are idiots. Uh, he, uh, what you meant by Bill and Ted, they're sort of idiots. I mean, I could add something, but I won't. No, you're I'm, not allowed. So, yeah. I, but I got what the way he was going. It was a good takedown, and, and the legacy of it probably. And, uh, yeah, it's leaning just slight edge to Mike Carlson. He gets it. I, I agree as well, based on my notes here and just uh, overall thoughts. Very close. Damn it, Cody. Damn it, Cody. You were very close. But Mike does not get a point. He still only has one point. Sam well, has three. Good luck uh, against this. So uh, but how round get, of applause like, for Cody Decker. You're going to help us now in this final round. Hey, you, you made it to the 100th episode of Movie I Fights. Did. Don't be sad, man. I did. And you're I'm, welcome back anytime. You are aware I just went from 77 to like 83 <laughs> with that loss. So, ah, right. let's let everyone go give him a thumbs up on Twitter. No, don't you dare. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we love you. All right, uh, here we go. We're now in a speed round. Sam, oh, you're God. back in it. Oh God, so I forgot how this works. Four to one. Four. It's three to three one. Three to one. Yeah, how does one. this work? Oh, okay. Speed round will work. Basically, I'm going to ask you a question. You're yep. going to have to answer it quickly. Yep. Uh, if you both say the same answer at the same time, it's whoever said it first. Got it. If you say it second, you'll have to pick another answer. Got it. Once you've selected your answer, you'll have 20 seconds to give us your argument. The time will start when you start speaking, so Got you can't have a quick second to think. Okay. Uh, then you'll have 10 second rebuttals. Dan will be on the clock, uh, and we're ready to go. Are you guys ready for question number one? And it's first. Of for all the marbles. Say? Yeah, uh, well, yeah. Uh, no, it's... Right. Uh, I have five questions here. Oh, and we're doing all five for sure. No, if no. you if you don't get the next two, he's out, right? Right. So he's going to five. Yeah, I'm that's correct. We yeah. were right. there. Just answer the first question, and I'll tell you Just as try, we go. Try to win every question. You need to get a lot of questions. Yeah. Right. 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 I need to sweep this. Okay, yeah. behind by two. Do, do I need to be watching that screen? You're going to be just for this first one, okay? So a picture is going to jump up on the screen for our first question. It's our bargain bin. We love getting these from you guys. And this one's going to come in from JPEG1098. We're going to show you two DVDs. Which one should we buy? Go ahead. Step Brothers! Brothers. Oh, <laughs> shit! <laughs> I couldn't tell. I I thought I heard Sam a little... Yeah, nah. You heard Sam? Okay, great. Two people confirmed Sam. Great, <sighs> so you got it there, Sam. I could right. not tell. All right. So Sam got Step Brothers. And that means, uh, Mike, you'll be second, and you got 21 Jump Street. Okay, Mike? Yes. So you have a second. All right, time starts when you're ready, and you start <clears> speaking. <throat> I go, I'm first? You have okay. 20 seconds, and the time will start when you start speaking. Got it. Okay. Uh, 
Step Brothers is absolutely the better of the two movies there. You have Will Ferrell at the top of his game, John C. Reilly at the top of his game, Adam McKay at the top of his game. Uh, the supporting cast is phenomenal. That movie has so many wonderful, funny, memorable moments in it. It is absolutely a classic. People talk about it as one of the classics of the last, comedy classics of the last 10, 15 years, and I believe... All right, Mike? Uh... Step Brothers is fine, but it is absolutely it is absolutely like kind of just Anchorman light. It is not as good. We're talking about Twenty One Jump Street, which is actually a, a more original film. This is we're talking Lord and Miller. We're talking something that was a sleeper. There's no way this thing was going to be good, but it is. It's incredibly good. It's got action. It has got comedy. Everybody. There's actually a bromance going on, and it's heart. This is a movie with heart. Step Brothers does not have heart. It's just. If you want to talk about bromance, Step Brothers is the ultimate bromance, and there was nothing original about 21 Jump Street. It was based on a TV series. Step Brothers is a completely original concept featuring completely original characters. Ten seconds, it starts when you start speaking, Mike. 21 Drum Street takes an idea that was silly from the 80s and actually makes it into something that we want to see that comes back and franchises. Step Brothers is just two guys yelling at each other a while, and you have to have... <laughs> Woo! All right, that was a good round. All right, uh, we got all the time in. Uh, I'll go to you, Cody. You're helping now, Cody. Based on the arguments, you know, uh, honestly, you, you you lost me for a second when you mentioned more more original, mm -hmm. but then you kind of got me back there at the last second by uh, mentioning that you know took an old idea and made it interesting. So that you got me there. It is more it is wrong from a game Hold standpoint. On. Hold on. All right. It's right. Survivor. Their jury has to help decide the winner. I'm, I'm, I'm helping. I'm, I'm, I'm listening, but He's creating I felt as that. though yours, your arguments. I'm only going this off arguments. He doesn't not get the final say. say. I got it, Cody. Damn. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, for me, I think if Mike had proceeded to that line of questioning he was ending with, it might have had more resonance, but his opening argument was completely refuted by Sam's. It wasn't enough of strong enough rebuttal for me. I got to go with Sam on this. See, I do think his rebuttal was strong. You're making me rethink his opening. <sighs> I mean, all I heard from Sam was just everyone's at the top of their game, which I feel like he did just persuade So in the beginning. So the I was with him until that final where I think it's just two dudes yelling at each other. This redefined an era and we created a franchise. Mm. That was impressive. I gotta give it to Mike. Oh, all right. Two. <laughs> Sam looks like he's gonna throw up. <laughs> now, now I know how you feel after your college football. <laughs> you can sit there and tell me empirically, based on the arguments, based on the arguments, based on the arguments. Right, I love well. this. There we go. You're very still well. in it. You're still in it. You're still in the lead. Here we oh, go. Geez. Here we go. Number yeah, two. Right where I want. <laughs> where? Where? <laughs> Where would you rather be a student? Hogwarts or Xavier's School for the Gifted? Xavier's Xavier. School for the Gifted. Okay, uh, Sam got Xavier's. Fuck. <laughs> Hogwarts. And Mike got Hogwarts. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you, I heard you first, so you're yep. up first, Sam. Xavier's, uh, right. 20 seconds when you begin speaking. Xavier's School for the Gifted is not fantasy, it's not about dragons and sorcery, it's about actual mutant powers that are going to be real life important things that you need to know how to control, and you can learn that at Xavier's School for the Gifted. These are these are talents and skills that will change the world if used properly and guided correctly, and that's the only place you're gonna receive that proper guidance. <laughs> okay, Mike. When I go to a school, I wanna think what is gonna be safe. I want safety at a place, okay? Xavier's school literally gets attacked every couple issues. <laughs> Hogwarts was attacked once at the end of one of the movies. They have a lot less evil people attacks. I want myself to live. I want to be alive. There are sentinels just blowing the shit. This whole place is blown up literally 25 times, if not more. Whew, all right, that's good. You got 10 seconds final. Let's hear some new tactics from both of you. Go ahead, Sam, whenever you're ready. You made no arguments whatsoever for Hogwarts, just against Xavier's. And here's my argument brother. to that. And here's my argument to that. The reason that there are uh, the Hogwarts are never going to be able to defend against any decks because they didn't get taught anything. Hogwarts has whimsical English magic. There are candies. There are fun goblins. There are fun characters. The ex Xavier's Mansion of people that are sad. I've been to Wizarding World of Harry Potter, and if it's anything close to that, it's going to be the, like. <laughs> That's everything. Did you get his 10 seconds? Yeah, 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 yeah. 10 yes. seconds. Okay, wow. Uh, Dan, I'm going to you first. I gotta go, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> 
Cody. <laughs> Based on arguments, <laughs> based on the arguments, Mike, because your rebuttal, you didn't get a, ch you didn't really, <laughs> you didn't get to spit it out. out. <laughs> I, maybe I missed the part where he talked about the virtues of Hogwarts. Whimsical English fun. teachers, it's fun <laughs> like <laughs> Disneyland. Yeah, <laughs> I would have gone with Sam, but it's two to one. Uh, so uh, Mike gets the point. All right. It's, it's three to three. We're tied a, now. It's wow. a best of three game series right now okay. for all the sports people that apparently, according to Cody, don't watch the show. Uh. <laughs> they do. All right, guys. In honor of our hundredth episode, what movie would be easiest to watch a hundred times in a row? Oh, that's not a multi. That's not a mm -mm. Die Hard. Mike. Gotta pick something. There's something Rush in there. Rashomon. 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 <laughs> okay. All right, and Sam, whenever you're ready. Die Hard is the ultimate action adventure movie. It has comedy. It has action. It has adventure. It has John fucking McClane, one of the greatest stars, most watchable, repeatably watchable stars, and repeatably watchable stories of all time. It's about a dude who has to face an entire army by himself, and the man perseveres, and he does it with a smile. Mike? Uh, <laughs> Rashomon is a movie about uh, people interpreting a different events different ways. So I would t uh, tell you to have an exercise to yourself. Watch this movie a hundred times, and you write down after each viewing what you saw, what you what was different. This is obviously going to be a mental exercise. This is not a good thing to watch a, a movie a hundred times in a row. This is something that you're going to experience like the character. Yours sounds like fucking terrible homework <laughs> that everyone will regret around viewing number three. Mine is fun. Mine is a movie you can a hundred percent get behind and enjoy on the 80th viewing as much as you did on the first. Both of these are terrible homework assignments. Let's be very clear about this, but mine actually has something to do. You are living this movie. You're not going to be able to walk on glass over 100 times. You're just going to be bored. Mine at least is intellectually. Whew. All right. I mean, I got to go first this time, right? I got to give it to Mike. I mean, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Sam got me on that I was going to throw this one. <laughs> Sam got me on that one. That did sound like terrible homework. Cody, where do you stand? I'm with you. Uh, he, Sam got me. <laughs> Dan, terrible Sam homework. had me a terrible homework. <laughs> Good line. Just wanted to see how angry he got. <laughs> he was upset. <laughs> All right. It's still anyone's game. Here we go. This is a this or that. Malkovich or Gary Oldman? Malkovich. Oldman. All right. Well, there you go. You both got what you wanted. Uh, Sam, you have Malkovich. 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 Here we go. Oh, I go first? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to go with Malkovich because Malkovich had the balls to skewer himself in the most outrageous way possible. People got inside his head, and he owned that. He owned that movie, and it talked about his entire body of work, the jewel thief comment. Uh, uh, Malkovich is an American icon. Uh, we're talking Gary Oldman, who's one of the greatest chameleon actors of all time, like so versatile. I mean, Malkovich is good, but like we're talking like uh, uh, a guy who can play like a junkie. We're talking a guy who can play a straight ahead Commissioner Gordon type. We're talking a guy who can play like kind of a dashing rebel, like a serious black. This is a guy who can literally do it all. Malkovich is good, but he does not have the range of a, of a Gary Oldman. Malkovich absolutely has the range of a Gary Oldman. Uh, a river runs through it, as well as uh, uh, the uh, assassination of the president movie, uh, which is called In the Line of Fire. In the line of fire. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but Malkovich, at, especially at this point in his career, has kind of just sort of turned into a caricature in the way that Christopher Walken has, where he's great and he's cool and he's weird. But we're talking about Gary Oldman, who's still doing great work. Like, I didn't even realize until I was older than two Roman. <laughs> Ooh, Cody, it's your uh, turn. I, 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 I had went to Mike because he mentioned you mentioned one movie and discussed one movie, and he was mentioning a wide variety of versatility. <laughs> yeah, that's where I was sadly leading to Dan, though. Sadly, well, uh, for his sake, <laughs> sadly, for his sake. mother, he's, for he's Sam's lost. Sake. Uh, yeah, strong opening by Sam on the being John Malkovich, but the chameleon. 
Yeah, I was. I leaned toward Mike as well. Yep. Sadly for Sam, we all no. did. So that's, that's wow. Right. I, I lean that way also. <laughs> I actually misheard you when you said the two oh. names. <laughs> oh, there you go. I would have said Oldman in a heartbeat. <laughs> Uh, well, so that means we're He's tied good. here. I yeah. think this, is, this hasn't this happened in a while. Final yeah. question. Final question. Oh, tied. This is it, guys. No, so so exciting, guys. So Ooh, exciting. This is an open-ended one, okay? Uh, okay, good. Just warning you. What's the all-time most disappointing movie sequel? Matrix 2. The all-time most disappointing movie sequel. Oh, God. Um... How many seconds do I have? Can I have 20 seconds? You have 10 seconds. I have 10 seconds. Um, the all-time most disappointing movie sequel. <sighs> Love that music. Yeah, well, it's so tense. Um, Five. Four. The Godfather Part 3. Ooh. Hmm? Good one. Good, got it in there. Okay. We have Godfather 3 versus Matrix 2. Mm -hmm. Shit. All right. Mike, you're up first. Matrix 1 is incredible. And not only is it just a movie that everyone loves, it was something that felt like a revolution in cinema and the way people would shoot. It was so exciting. It's still on people's lists. That makes it when we went into the theater and sat down and watched Matrix 2, everyone was like, what the fuck is this? This thing is crazy. Like, it didn't even make sense that this could be from the same people that made the first one. It's something that everyone... Ev the Godfather Part 3 had such a pedigree of movies heading into it that people expected so much from it, and it was such a gigantic letdown that it is still referred to often as the worst sequel ever made in terms of what people were expecting. People refer to it all the time as the biggest letdown in continued storytelling in cinema was The Godfather Part 3. Matrix 2 is so bad, as Quentin Tarantino himself said, it hurts the first movie it's so bad. It takes the first movie out of the conversation, whereas Godfather 1 and 2 are, are don't even and people don't talk, they just talk about that shitty third one. I think what makes The Matrix not as uh, egregious is that it is a fantasy-based movie, and there was so much they could have gone with, and, and I don't know that they did it right, they did it wrong, it's debatable. Godfather Part 3 is no debate. He got a couple extra seconds. You okay, Mike? Uh... He went past the buzzer. Right, right? Um, I just said it's no debate. All I'm, uh... I'll just, uh you get three seconds. Okay. <laughs> Two seconds. Oh, it's starting already? Uh, Godfather 3 Come doesn't on. hurt the first Come two on. movies. He just repeated himself. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just being fair. Oh, whew. All right, I got I got based on the arguments, I have an instinct, but I just want to go to you two first. Cody? I, uh, I really liked the argument of uh, heavy pedigree of the first two movies, two movies leading into a bad thing, and then, but your your argument on that it hurts the first movie is, is pretty, pretty good. Dan? Yeah, I, I think I'd lean toward Mike. Yeah, that last line. That last line, I, I don't think Godfather 3 hurt Godfather 1 and 2 as much as Matrix 2 hurt Matrix. That is a fanboy thing to say, that a new thing hurts an old thing. Does the new Ghostbusters hurt the old Ghostbusters, guys? Yes, yes it, does. it does. Oh, does it? It does? <laughs> yeah, you guys want to be on that side of history? Uh, well, all I know is in this side of history, Mike Carlson just all won right. the game! Wow. I'm, I look forward to the debate online. That was how you go down. Man, I love... I, Sam always is in a dark place in this show. <laughs> I hope you come back, because you were an amazing player. I love hearing you on this, and uh, you all played a fantastic game this time. Uh, holy crap, we haven't gone to the last one in forever. Uh, so that was great. Thank you, Mike, congrats. Uh, we will stick around for a bit to talk more after the fight. Uh, let's give everybody your plugs. Mike Carlson, where can people find you? Oh, I'm on Twitter at Fat Carlson, P-H-A-T-C-A-R-L-S-O-N. Uh, oh, uh, if it's... Tournament. Uh, there's a show I'm doing at UCB. Uh, if it's, if it's you're watching now, or if you're watching Saturday, Saturday night, midnight at UCB Theater LA. You guys should uh, go if you haven't gone. It's, it's always a tournament of I'll be it's, there. Uh, I'm gonna be arguing about things like this, much like this. That was distracting. Cody Decker, <laughs> celebration's coming, yeah. so hurry up. Not uh, yeah. <laughs> follow me on Twitter at Decker6. Yes, go to Tournament of Nerds. It's a great show. Uh, and uh, root for the Red Sox. <laughs> <laughs>
They employed me. Sam, Sam Levine, what can we, where can people find you? Uh, people can find me on my new streaming series, Crunch Time, through Rooster Teeth. Uh, the first two episodes are for free right now. You can watch them on YouTube. Just Google and look for Crunch Time, or you can go to roosterteeth.com and find them there. And then uh, we have four more episodes that are going to get released every Sunday. And if you are a first member on roosterteeth.com, you can see those. You can get a free first membership for 30 days. Watch them all uh, on roosterteeth.com. So check that out, Crunch Time. It's a really, really good series. Love it. Check it out. Dan Murr on the couch. Look what's next to you. There's a cake. <laughs> yeah, oh! 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 Look at this. Hey! Oh, my goodness. Hey! What? Hey! Everybody have a treat. Hey! It's a Screen Junkies cake. Show that off before you. Yeah, look at that. Wow, there's actually a Screen Junkies logo. Someone did some good artwork on that. Yeah, I, I Flip I it made up it, a little bit. I made it with clip art. Flip it up a little bit. <laughs> look at that. I, you see I the logo? I don't want to make the cake. Oh, oh, Mara. Thank you, Mara. <laughs> wow, look at that. It looks. It has the logo and the colors and a hundred candles. Wow, thank you so much. <laughs> That's a <laughs> hell of a knife. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice nice knife. Oh, no. Gee whiz. All right. Well, let's we'll, uh, celebrate to everybody. We're going to celebrate an after the fight, so if you'd like to continue the celebration with us, you can watch us there live on Screen Junkies Plus, but I just want to thank you guys, the viewers. Holy shit, we would, who would have thought Dan Merle, Spencer, all of us, Joe, Ken, that we'd make 100 episodes of you guys still watching us talk for two hours about movies. We are so grateful to you guys, and here's to 100 more, and so much more to come. Don't forget, hashtag MovieFights100, and uh, email us your favorite moments so we can do a special event for you guys at the end of the year. And thank you so much for watching. We will see you next week. Have a wonderful week. Weekend. Bye bye! Every podcast we put on YouTube comes with this kick ass graphic listing all the topics your favorite Screen Junkies podcasters are talking about. If you click the topics, you can skip around and choose your own podcast battle royale. Go ahead, try them all. If you haven't already, subscribe to Screen Junkies on YouTube to join us for future fights. Or if you prefer to listen on iTunes, click the logo to download an audio version. 